Hello and welcome to episode 65 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR. As always, I'm joined by fellow co-founder Evan Silva and it is time, the moment you've all been waiting for. Our 2020 draft kit is here and live on the site. Yes, that's right. If you head to the site right now, you will find all the information and details of our plan for the draft kit. I'll try to summarize somewhat quickly here. The draft kit is only $30, which you know I find to be uh, egregiously cheap, but Evan insisted. So it's $30. It comes with a $25 coupon for FFPC. In other words, if you play in a $35 league or a tournament or whatever on FFPC, that league will only cost you $10. Everybody who signs up for the draft kit gets this $25 credit at FFPC. Be sure you uh, wait for the email after you sign up, by the way, before you sign up for FFPC. Um, of course, in the draft kit, all the staples will be in there. Uh, Evan's top 150 is up. Evan's tiers are up. He has 102 running backs, 117 wide receivers, et cetera, et cetera. Karain's top 250 for Dynasty is up. There is tons of stuff from myself and Thorman and eventually Herms and Brandon Thorne as well. Evan's team-by-team preview is coming later in the summer as well. And then this year, some stuff we didn't have last year, we'll be adding rankings and content for two quarterback for Superflex, uh, auction values, tight end premium, a lot more data-driven analysis, which I've been working on behind the scenes a bunch. So uh, honestly, uh, $30 is just absurdly cheap. Obviously, I'm biased, but I'm really not just saying that. Um, anyways, Evan, I have rambled long enough. Uh, what's going on? How's it going? What's up, man? Stayed up uh, late last night looking at uh, just comparing my top 150 to FFPC best ball ADP, and there were a lot of outliers, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things to do because uh, beating a market uh, at this time is extremely, extremely valuable. So if you guys are doing drafts now for the season or you're doing best ball drafts uh being ahead of the market there's gonna be a lot of these guys adps change by july and august once more casual people start doing some more research so we're just gonna go through some guys today that evan is either really uh significantly higher or significantly lower on the market talk about why and what we think will happen to the market come july and august let's start with a young man who is entering his fourth nfl season but is still just 23 years old and that is juju smith schuster FFPC ADP is 47th overall, wide receiver 15. Evan has Juju 18th overall, wide receiver 8. This is a drastic upgrade over market. Evan, we've talked plenty about Juju and the bounce back that we think is coming for the Steelers offense already. Wide receiver 8 is extremely aggressive. Talk to me about Juju. I think first we have to talk about the Steelers offense in general. And, you know, if we're going to go hard on the Steelers offense this year, and it's looking like we are, Um, you know, we're, we're betting on Ben Roethlisberger to a large extent. I mean, we do not want to get involved in a situation with Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph. Again, that was an absolute disaster. Uh, And and betting on Ben Roethlisberger at age, what, 38, 39, coming off three reattached elbow uh, tendons is scary. Uh, But I think that according to, by all accounts, his, um, his recovery has gone on schedule, and there have been no indications of a setback. And he's had a, a long time to recover because, remember, that injury really occurred in week one of last season. It carried into week two, and that's when his season officially came to an end. But I think he suffered the injury in week one. Um, so he's had – he's you know, by the, by the time that the season starts, he will have had almost a full year uh, to recover. But that is the caveat, obviously – with Juju Smith-Schuster. Juju Smith-Schuster, as recently as this time last year, was looking like a a fringe first-round fantasy draft pick. And now his ADP has sunk into like the third and the fourth rounds. Um, This is a player that uh, at age 22 had the most yards of of any player in NFL history uh, by that age. Uh, And uh, he's entering his contract year. Uh, And he has, you know, I'm a big believer in quarterback and pass catcher established rapports. And I think that that is going to be, you know, accentuated by the times that we are living in today and the lack of offseason practice and preparation. And by far, I mean, there's nobody else in the pass catcher core that has the built-in chemistry and rapport that Juju Smith-Schuster does with Ben Roethlisberger. 
Uh, Deontay Johnson spent almost no time last year catching – and I love Deontay Johnson, but, he, you know, he caught all his passes from Mason Rudolph and uh, Duck Hodges. Eric Ebron is new at tight end. Um, James Washington really has never been a favorite of Ben Roethlisberger, and uh, Chase Kaufman has never caught a pass from Ben Roethlisberger in his life. Chase so, Claypool, yep. Chase Claypool, yes. Yep. Um, and, you know, so I think that that established rapport with Juju Smith-Schuster, just how talented he is. I mean, last, I th- just think that people are falling victim a little bit too much to recency bias. And I think that Juju Smith-Schuster, you know, as like a, 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 a somewhat long shot, I, I think that his odds should be set somewhere between like 15 or, or 20 to 1, um, maybe, maybe 20 to, to 30, somewhere in that range uh, to lead the NFL in targets. I mean, I think that that's very much within his range of potential outcomes. I think it was for him last year. And I definitely think that that has not changed. Yeah. I, I think there's like, um, and you know, season long people are going to hate me, but I think the sophistication at the DFS level has um, evolved to a point where Juju Smith-Schuster, people understand context and you would never see like a recency bias. Like you see with Juju, like the context is he was playing in not even an NFL offense last year, the year before that he caught 11, 111 passes for 1400 yards and seven touchdowns. So um, understanding why his stats were what they were last year, as Evan said, heading into a contract year at age 23, I I just don't see a very big bear case on Juju Smith-Schuster. I guess somebody could make a case, hey, the Steelers team is going to be extremely defensive oriented. But when Roethlisberger is under center, he's essentially calling the plays and he's dialing up passes at what, you know, Pat talked about, Thorman talked about in his article that's in the draft kit about how he expects the Steelers to play this year in terms of run pass ratio, in terms of how fast they'll play. And I think with Ben under center, that makes a lot of sense. So I don't see hardly any downside at this 47 overall ADP. I think there's downside at Evan's ranking of 18th overall, but you know, there's still plenty of upside to be had where you can actually get them. And Evan's talked plenty about how just because Evan has him 18th overall doesn't mean you have to take him 18th overall. You have to understand your draft uh, and where he might go. Yeah, there's definitely some nuance to, you know, being actually on the clock in your draft and understanding, you know, where ADP is. And we're, 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 we're going to spend the entire offseason talking about stuff like this. You do not have to draft Juju Smith-Schuster within the top 20 because you know that he's probably going to, you know, there's a good chance he'll be available to you at your next pick. Right, exactly. All right, let's go to an old friend of the show, one of the oldest friends of the show, Brother Raheem, Raheem Mostert. Um, uh, sad for me and Evan to say this, but gosh, I mean, FFPC 42nd overall RB 24 is insane to me. And Evan agrees 86th overall for Evan RB 34. We know Jerry McKinnon has a chance to come back. Jeff Wilson is going to be in the mix most likely. And Tevin Coleman, I mean, God, Tevin Coleman in that first playoff game, the divisional round, they gave Tevin Coleman 22 carries. He went off for 105 yards and two touchdowns to suggest that Raheem Mostert, who doesn't really have a pass game role and who will be sharing time almost certainly with Tevin and Jeff Wilson should be the RB24, uh, escapes me how how that's even plausible. Uh, I like where Evan has him 86th overall. If you're using Evan's 150, I don't think you'll be getting Brother Raheem much uh, at all. Um, mm-hmm. Seems pretty open and shut here with Brother Raheem, Evan, but anything on him. Yeah, it seems like the recency bias and remembering the 49ers playoff run has really uh, skyrocketed Raheem Mostert to to where he, uh, I mean, he doesn't belong to be that high in, in ADP. And, you know, we, I mean, I, I haven't made more money off of anybody in preseason DFS than Raheem Mostert. So, I, you know, I have no, I have no bias against him. I think it's, it's the recency bias that, that is pushing him up too high. He had eight games as the 49ers lead back beginning in week 13 last season. Okay. Eight games. He had more than, he didn't have more than two targets in any of those games. Um, you know, that, that lack of a passing game role is a big concern. Uh, Jarek McKinnon trying to come back. Tevin Coleman looks like he's definitely coming back. Uh, Jeffrey Wilson. Uh, he he's back. You know, the, this is not going to be a workhorse sort of situation. It's not going to be a, it's going to be a situation where he's, living off a lot of, you know, rushing attempts. And um, that's not the way to win in fantasy. And, you know, really, really like him as a player. You, you remember when we identified him as a guy, man, this guy was a freak athlete. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did get drafted. I believe he played at Temple. Is that right? Somewhere around here, somewhere around Philly. I don't think it was Temple, but somewhere around here. Yeah. And, 
Um, you know, we just identified in one, one day in like 2015 or 2016 preseason DFS, like all the other Eagles running backs were uh, unavailable. And it was just going to be the Raheem Mostert show. And he just absolutely crushed. It, it, that, that was a, a great, great day. And I think he did it a couple more times um, when all was said and done. But yeah, I mean, I think that this is just it, a, a fairly egregious overpricing by the market based on like uh, the 49ers playoff success is yeah. this is not the way to be you know projecting players in fantasy yeah he actually went to Purdue so we were wrong about that but anyways uh yeah and, and listen you're asking a lot out of this 49ers offense and team really to generate as many rush attempts per game as they generated last year I mean they were running the ball 30 40 times in a game often that's just going to be uh really hard to replicate and also we want to be targeting guys uh, whether it's half PPR, full PPR, whatever, who play really well in the pass game. It just raises your floor and ceiling so much. So easy fade for me on Raheem Mostert as well. Let's get to Adam Thielen, FFPC 54th overall, the wide receiver 18. Evan has Adam Thielen 19th overall, the wide receiver nine. And people are going to say, God, Adam Thielen was so brutal last year. Major hamstring and ankle issues for Adam Thielen last year, Evan. I assume you're just looking past that as a total fluke right off season that Adam Thielen had in 2019. Yeah, it really did not have much of an injury history at all uh, before that. And this is another situation of court betting on quarterback wide receiver chemistry. Um, in his first year with the Vikings, Kirk Cousins really didn't show much of rapport with Kyle Rudolph. Irv Smith, I think is you know still a, a sort of you know on the come player. Um, Justin Jefferson is a rookie. I think that he's going to be you know more pro ready than your typical rookie. Uh, but I think that Adam Thielen is in position to dominate targets in this offense. And uh, it, it really just comes down to that. And I think that he's a fantastic player when he's healthy. I mean, you remember he set the NFL record the previous season for most 100, most consecutive 100 yard games. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm betting on that rapport with Kirk Cousins. And, and I also think that the Vikings defense could take a step back, put them in, in more, uh, uh, you know, past friendlier situations. They were extremely run heavy last year. They lost every single cornerback from their nickel package. All three of them uh, left, and, and they're they're uh, trading those guys out for you know a rookie and Mike Hughes, who really has not shown very much as being a former first round pick. So, I think this team ends up throwing more. They play indoors, and that rapport with Kirk Cousins is really what I'm betting on being ahead of consensus on Adam Thielen. Yeah. I like Adam Thielen a lot. I played him a couple of times last year as he was coming off injury, which proved to be a mistake. He just clearly was not healthy. But I think coming off of this offseason, I think he'll be ready to rock. It doesn't sound like it's any kind of long-term thing. It was a bad hamstring pull. All right, let's get to one that I think Evan and I might disagree on a little bit here. Evan uh, has Tyler Higby down as the tight end nine, 92nd overall. FFPC is slightly higher, tight end seven, 61st overall. I will give the caveat that FFPC is tight end premium scoring. So uh, 1.5 PPR for tight ends. That said, I think Evan is pretty far lower than market on Higby. Uh, my point on, I think I kind of want, want to be in line with the market on Higby for reasons that we've talked about on this podcast before. Like tight ends are not capable of doing what Tyler Higby did down the stretch last year. Like most guys just don't do it. Over the final five weeks of last year, Tyler Higby had four 100 yard games, caught at least seven balls in all of them. Like that just doesn't happen. So like that's not happening for Austin Hooper in uh, Cleveland. That's not happening for Jared Cook uh, in, in New Orleans. So I think, you know, there's role questions, Gerald Everett coming back. But man, you know, just that I've seen Tyler Higby do that over a stretch that other tight ends just literally cannot do. It's at least in the range for Tyler Higby. So that's why I'd have him probably closer to tight end seven where he is in market on FFPC. But Evan, tell the people why you're lower. So before week 13 of the 2019 season, Tyler Higby had played in 58 career NFL games. He was mostly a blocker. He reached 50 yards twice in those 58 games. In 3% of his games, he got the 50 yards. Uh, Gerald Everett, up until week 13, had out-targeted Tyler Higby 56 to 27. Gerald Everett suffers um, – uh, like a, a wrist injury and a knee injury. And after that, he played, I think, uh, four snaps the rest of the season or, or, you know, just barely played the rest of the season. Tyler Higby explodes. 
okay? And, I mean, Tyler Higby played at an incredible level. I had him on my FFPC main event teams. He was carrying us. Nobody on the roster was doing anything. Tyler Higby was, like, literally carrying us on his back. So, you know, I, I really like Tyler Higby, you know, at least what he showed. But it, this is five games of dominance and 58 games of being, like, a no-show. The Rams – okay, so Gerald Everett is back. The Rams drafted Bryson Hopkins out of Purdue in the fourth round. Really good athlete, great uh, track record of production uh, in college. And he's a guy who I think could take a little, a little bit of a load off both of the guys, uh, Tyler Higby and Gerald Everett. And it's just – it's such a small sample to bet on. I mean, look, I, I, I've come to the point where I had Tyler Higby in the top ten. You know, what, a couple of months ago I had him like tight end 15 or something. Um, <laughs> But I, I'm going to make, I'm going to stay below consensus on him, and I'm going to stay way above consensus on Gerald Everett, who and I just uh, did a, an article about late round sleepers in best ball, and Gerald Everett was near the top of the list. Uh, let me ask you this: I think maybe one of the reasons Tyler Higby never really had a chance was because they were exclusively running eleven personnel. It seems like maybe they're going to run more twelve this year. Do you think that helps Higby and Everett's outlook? at all because it's possible they could both be viable yes yeah and i mean i think they are both going to be viable and that's why i have tyler higby as a top 10 fantasy tight end and gerald everett as you know a sleeper that i mean especially in ffpc where you have tight end premium scoring but gerald everett should not be as low as he is he's outside of the top 180 players on ffpc adp right now and that's just just criminally low i think he's a, a buy in dynasty as well um, so I'm fading Higby a little bit and I'm on Gerald Everett, who again, out-targeted Tyler Higby before that week 13 date, 56 to 27 last season. By the way, the article that Evan's referring to is in the draft kit right now. It's his favorite players with an ADP of 180 or greater in FFPC. All right. This one is going to open the most people's eyes, Evan. This is the one that people are going to say, man, I like Calvin Ridley, but Evan is out of his mind. Uh, people are going to say, <laughs> I, I like Calvin Ridley, but wide receiver 10 ahead of DeAndre Hopkins, who is the wide receiver three by ADP, uh, is insane. Calvin Ridley's FFPC ADPs are 52nd overall wide receiver 16. Again, Evan, 20th overall wide receiver 10 ahead of DeAndre Hopkins. So everybody likes Calvin Ridley, Evan. Like anybody who's intelligent, uh, who follows this stuff closely, likes Calvin Ridley. I don't think anybody in the industry, though, likes Calvin Ridley as much as you. So let's talk about it here. And let's not talk about how Calvin Ridley is going to have a good year. I think we all agree. How is he going to have a better year than DeAndre Hopkins, than Mike Evans, than Josh Jacobs, than some of these other guys that you have him ahead of? Well, I guess we have to go through, you know, disparaging Josh Jacobs and DeAndre Hopkins, but that, that will be for uh, later, later shows. Um, but Calvin Ridley, his floor ceiling combination is just so, so perfect. And this is a, another example, and he's right next to Juju. Actually, I have Juju at wide receiver seven, uh, Adam Thielen at wide receiver eight, Calvin Ridley at wide receiver nine. These guys are all bunched tightly together, and they're all guys that you can typically get a, a round later, if not two rounds later, uh, especially in Ridley's case, uh, as opposed to where I have them. So you're going to have to keep that in mind you know, while you're actually on the draft board. But with with Calvin Ridley, that floor ceiling combination, like the situation is so similar to Chris Godwin last year, albeit with even less target competition. Um, the uh, Calvin Ridley is, uh, I mean, the you know, no Austin Hooper. Austin Hooper is gone. They're going to replace him with Hayden Hurst. Or I look, I, I like him in fantasy I'm as, as the tight end ten, but he's also a guy changing teams. Uh, during an offseason with limited practice and preparation time. And, you know, we have not seen him produce at like a big time level. Is he going to be commanding targets consistently from Matt Ryan? You know, I, I don't know about that. I do have extreme faith that Calvin Ridley will. Uh, and then third receiver is Russell Gage. Uh, they got rid of, you know, since the, the midway part through last season, they've gotten rid of um, Devontae Freeman, Mohamed Sanu, Austin Hooper and Justin Hardy and the Falcons right now have the most unaccounted for targets in the NFL. And it's not even close, mm -hmm. not even close. So I think the targets are going to become even more concentrated toward Julio and toward Calvin Ridley. Julio uh, is 31 years old and posted the lowest average, uh, the lowest yards per target of his entire career 
last season. This defense is going to be bad. The Falcons have the toughest schedule in the NFL based on a, a, a combined opponent win totals. So everything here is adding up for lots and lots of pass attempts, lots and lots of target concentration in Calvin Ridley's direction. And if something happens to Julio, Calvin Ridley is going to tear the absolute cover off. So he's a guy that I'm going to make sure that I am ahead of consensus on throughout the offseason. Yeah. And I was looking at, you know, normally we want our quarterbacks as favorites. You know, they perform much better as favorites. Typically, I actually looked at Matt Ryan, though, specifically Matt Ryan throughout his career has actually performed slightly better from a fantasy perspective as a dog. And they're going to be a dog a ton this year. We talked about on the win totals pod. Uh, We talked about it as their schedule strength. I mean, uh, they're going to be a dog a ton this year. I think Matt Ryan is fine in that scenario, though. And and yeah, I'm optimistic on Calvin Ridley. I don't think I'm optimistic Calvin Ridley as Evan was. I think the difference between Godwin and Ridley was Godwin just like hadn't had a chance to show his ability yet. Like he had had such limited playing time. We have a pretty large sample of Calvin Ridley with a lot of playing time and not extremely elite production. Doesn't mean he won't have it this year, but like Godwin was, uh, went from somebody who didn't even have a chance to show what he had yet to someone who was so obviously like just the stone lock layup uh, to have a huge year last year. So yeah, it's interesting, man. I mean, Calvin Ridley is one of those guys who People, more people are going to hear Evan and other people talking about Calvin Ridley. By the time August comes around, Calvin Ridley will be going, uh, I would say, in probably the third round, right? I mean, it's probably um, time to get him would be now, I think, if you can get him in the fourth or the fifth. All right. Another guy that people like or used to like or maybe they still like is Drew Brees. Uh, Drew Brees in FFPC is the QB9, 94th overall. Evan did not even rank Drew Brees in his top 150, and you have to go to Evan's tiers to even find Drew Brees' name where he's the QB 17. Now, Drew Brees missed five games last year, but he's still 270 pass yards per game, 2.45 TDs. He was the QB 8 in fantasy last year, 41 years old. But Evan, you're not going to have zero Drew Brees if you leave him here as the QB 17. Talk to the people about why you're out on Drew Brees. I mean, he did perform really well uh, from an efficiency standpoint in, you know, a reduced sample last year due to the injury. Um, I think that after the Saints gave Taysom Hill uh, a big deal, it was it two years, 21 million, they're going to be even more incentivized to use him. Drew Brees is now 42. The Saints have a really good defense. They have, you know, maybe, you know, a, certainly a top three running game in the NFL. And, Uh, Drew Brees is just not, you know, a a guy that I think is going to be a a big time difference maker at the quarterback position. I have him quarterback 17 and um, he's just a guy that I'm going to bet against because of his situation and because that Taysom Hill factor, especially in the red zone, um, has the, you know, the potential to take away, you know, quite a few touchdowns, just quite, quite a few scoring opportunities from Drew Brees, again, on a team that, you know, can, can win with their running game and with their defense. Yeah, I was looking through who you have above Drew Brees and trying to think of guys that I would move Drew Brees above. I think I prefer Drew Brees uh, over Goff, but I would definitely go with Baker, Stafford, obviously Danny Dimes ahead of Brees. And I think it's close when you start getting to the Brady's and the Ben Roethlisberger and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, the Taysom Hill tilt is is so, so, so real. And I think when the Saints... Uh, are playing well it's run game and defense for sure and even more so as Drew Brees hits 41 so I don't mind being low on Drew Brees I have no problem with that whatsoever let's talk about uh, one more wide receiver here Tyler Lockett Uh, Evan has as the wide receiver 16 I can't believe his ADP is wide receiver 26 I'm not sure why people are so low exactly on Tyler Lockett of course it's tilting to watch Russell Wilson hand the ball off in the first half a ton but when the game's over and they ever when they do let Russ cook Lockett has these huge, huge ceiling games. Uh, talk to me about Tyler Lockett. It's third year in a row of being way above market on Tyler Lockett, and um, that's something I'm very, very satisfied with. Tyler Lockett is an absolute baller. He checks the box of having that incredible quarterback to receiver chemistry in place with Russell Wilson. I do think that DK Metcalf um, you know, is just going to keep getting better. That's what he did as a rookie. Start off real raw. They were only letting him run – really one route on one side of the field uh, early on, which I think was smart because that's all he did at Ole Miss. And then as the season progressed, they expanded his route tree. Dude's an absolute baller. And, but I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing from Tyler Lockett. I think that you know, the position that, that Tyler Lockett plays primarily in the slot, how, you know, how agile and darting he is uh, between the numbers and how he can 
win over the top. I mean, I love Tyler Lockett's game. I understand he is not going to compete for the league lead in volume, but man, he gets very, very efficient volume from Russell Wilson, who has just always been one of the most uh, efficient quarterbacks in the league. And that translates right to Tyler Lockett. I mean, when, when plays break down, Tyler Lockett can get open. Think about how difficult he is with his speed and agility to cover for more than a few seconds. I mean, he's you know, he, he's built to play with Russ. Yeah, one thing for context on this draft season that I want to mention is that a lot of running backs go early because wide receiver is so deep. I mean, God, you can get so many good wide receivers in the middle rounds like we're talking about and in the late rounds too, which we'll talk about on another podcast. But I think one of the reasons that, um, that the, the – uh, overall numbers are off here somewhat is that ADP on running backs are through the roof. And we'll talk more about general draft strategy yeah. as the summer moves along, but God, no, I mean, that, running backs- that's, that's a, that's a great point. And that's something that I noticed going through the ADP is that running backs are weight like Keyshawn Vaughn, who I think we're going to, we're going to talk yeah. about here in a minute, like his FFPC ADP in, in terms of overall his his running his uh, overall running back ranking. Isn't terribly different. I don't think yeah. from my, but where he is placed in their ADP overall versus where he is in the top 150, drastic, dramatically different. Yeah. Um, but, but in this particular case, though, Tyler Lockett has the wide receiver 16. Or I have him as the wide receiver 16, and FFPC ADP has him as the wide receiver 26. Right. So, again, we're, you know, this can be the third straight year, way above consensus on Tyler Lockett. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, let's go to Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who we talked a lot about uh, coming out of the draft with Pat Corain and with you. Uh, obviously, we like Clyde Edwards Hilaire. We're not here to bash Clyde Edwards Hilaire at all. We are, however, here to say that Damian Williams is going to have a role. And I assume, Evan, that is why you have him 39th overall in the FFPC. He's going 20th. Yeah, and I have him as the RB15 and FFPC ADP as, as the RB14. So only a one spot difference in where they are in, in, in between these um, these rankings from just a straight positional standpoint, but again a big gap between uh, between overall and Clyde edwards helaire Look, you know I I think that Damian Williams is going to stay involved. I, th- I think that the Chiefs uh, really value the way that he pass blocks. I think that you know, no running back in the league runs a wheel route as well as Damian Williams. It might actually be a good thing for Damian Williams that he is. Uh, splitting time because you know he hasn't been able to consistently stay healthy but we also haven't seen Clyde Edwards Hilaire consistently stay healthy in the NFL yet either that's that's not that's not an easy thing to do I I really like Clyde Edwards Hilaire as a player you know we want a lot of uh, he made a lot of people's draft weekends by being the first running back selected at very long odds to do so Um, but I I really like where I where I have him and I don't I don't anticipate budging very much Uh, people are just going nuts for ring backs uh, early in uh, in the FFPC draft. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about another quarterback. And this might be one of my favorite late round quarterback targets, and that's Matthew Stafford, QB 14 in FFPC. Evan has him QB 11. Uh, Thorman had an article about the best FFPC uh, values right now, and he had Matthew Stafford on there, noted that Matthew Stafford was on pace for 5,000 yards, 38 touchdowns when he broke his back. I mean, he was playing incredibly. I mean, he was maybe one of the best scenes of his career. He was on pace and, you know, it's tough to extrapolate, but as Thorman mentioned, he was on pace to be the QB two last year behind only Lamar Jackson. I don't know if he would have sustained that 5,000 yard, 38 touchdown pace, but still dude was balling. So, so yeah, I think there's a really high floor with taking Matthew Stafford as a late round quarterback target. Talk to me about him and how you would compare him to some of these other late round quarterbacks that people are taking. Yeah, I, I just I have the same thinking as Pat Thorman does about Matthew Stafford. Uh, talked about the Lions as a sl- sneaky offensive stack uh, in in uh, my recent article about um, best ball and uh, larger field tournament season long stacks. And uh, you know Marvin Jones is coming back. I'm I'm above consensus on Marvin Jones. T.J. Hawkinson I think definitely has a chance to take a big step in his second NFL season. Kenny Galladay I think is a true alpha number one. Um, Danny Amendola, you know, is a, is a solid role player and, uh, they were, uh, Matthew Stafford last year before getting injured. I mean, they were really going, they were so aggressive throwing the ball. He had the lo- the highest a dot in the NFL and he was on pace for 38 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. And, uh, the Lions as a team were, uh, averaging 25.5 points per game, which 
would have at the end of the season ranked um, top six in the NFL. So I'm just a little bit higher on the Lions, I guess, than uh, than most people. And uh, being higher on Matthew Stafford than most people is a big part of that. Yeah, I mean, Josh Allen, uh, uh, Daniel Jones, uh, I think Baker. I think some of those guys uh, make sense as late round quarterbacks. Daniel Jones opening month schedule is absolutely brutal. So yeah. for season long guys, I don't know how viable that is anymore. But but yeah, um, definitely talk more about late round quarterbacks as we move along here in the summer. All right, Evan alluded to Keyshawn Vaughn. Uh, you know, uh, we've been lower, I think, in rookie rankings and in dynasty on Keyshawn Vaughn than maybe other people have. I'm fine with that take. Uh, RB30 on FFPC, Evan has him RB38. But as Evan mentioned, 57th overall, he's going in FFPC. Evan has him 100th overall. I'm just not convinced that Keyshawn Vaughn is going to be more than uh, a timeshare back with Ronald Jones, where with Darren Gunwable, maybe another addition coming to this backfield. Um, so yeah, I think I'm fine being out on Keyshawn Vaughn, and it sounds like you are too, Evan. Yeah, and this guy was one of my favorite like sort of sleepers before the draft, and then his landing spot just totally catapulted him up in, in people's minds. And I mean, I, I get it, but that's I'm not going to invest a, a top 30 overall running back pick into Keyshawn Vaughn. I mean, that's super, super aggressive. Uh, I still think that Ronald Jones is going to be involved. I still think that Dari Ogunbowale is going to be involved. I mean, Ogunbowale really kind of, as, as like a, a trustworthy pass blocker and a trustworthy receiver, he's sort of like a poor man's James White. I'm worried about him playing a lot with Tom Brady and Tom Brady being like, hey, you know, this is the running back that I trust. Let's roll with him. And, you know, he gives us, you know, everything that we need, sort of like James White would or even like Rex Burkhead would. Um, so, yeah, I, I just I, I guess I'm out on Keyshawn Vaughn. I didn't anticipate being, but just the landing spot just catapulted him yeah. way too high in people's minds. Yeah, and it sucks from, you know, from talking to Corrine too, like we kind of had to be out on Keyshawn Vaughn's price in Dynasty too. I mean, people are are going nuts, you know, taking Keyshawn Vaughn over like really extremely good wide receiver prospects, which, you know, I'm no Dynasty expert, but I think that's a pretty big uh, no-no is to pass on high floor ceiling wide receiver prospects in Dynasty over running back prospects. I think for obvious reasons about injury rates and and longevity and job security, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Two more we're going to hit here. First one is Terry McLaurin, uh, FFPC wide receiver 24 and 67th overall. Evan has Terry McLaurin 35th overall. But I thought what was interesting for Evan's ranking on Terry McLaurin was you had McLaurin over DK Metcalf, over Robert Woods, over Cortland Sutton, over Steph Diggs, over DJ Chark. Um, I have concerns about Terry McLaurin's QB play, obviously. But he did go 58, 9, 19, 7 as a rookie. Did it on just 6.6 .6 targets per game. Did it on just a 62% catch rate. I think both of those can get better. But I still think that on first glance, and I want to hear Evan's take, is that I would prefer DK Metcalf, Bob Woods, Corton Sutton over Terry McLaurin. Uh, and a lot of that has just had to do with team and wanting to bet on the freaking Redskins. But anyways, go ahead on Terry McLaurin. How many condoms do you wear when you draft? <laughs> <laughs> Taking Robert Woods over Terry McLaurin is like at least a three condom play. <laughs> um, no, I mean, these guys are all smashed together for a reason, though, too. I mean, McLaurin, I have like nine receivers here all in a row, you know, because they're, they're you know, it's a coin flip between them. But McLaurin, I have ahead of Metcalf and ahead of Woods because I think that McLaurin can – has the best shot at being his team's go-to number one receiver. Um, I have concerns about Dwayne Haskins too, but, you know, I think that uh, you can fall back on their, the uh, report that they developed in college. They did get to play, you know, Shower narrative. Out, uh, yeah. down, down the stretch of last season. McLaurin is just a baller. Like I want to bet on ballers who, you know, have a chance to, you know, uh, accrue a ton of volume. And I think that Terry McLaurin has that. He was one of the biggest winners, I thought, from the draft. The only you know, theoretically imposing threat to his uh, target market share was Antonio Gibson, who, I mean, we still don't know if he's going to be a running back or a, a wide receiver. They say uh, running back, yeah. Yes, weird. And uh, especially in that backfield where they have like nine running backs already. But, I mean, McLaurin, almost 1,000 yards as a rookie. 
uh, averaged over two uh, yards per route run. If you go back and look at the history of rookie receivers that average over two yards per route run, it's just a bunch of like future Hall of Famers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm betting on talent. I'm betting on his volume. And I'm letting the fact that his quarterback situation is shaky bring his ADP down. Again, this is a, not a guy that you need to be taking at 35th overall. Yeah. You know, this is a guy that definitely like by, by 50th overall, you know, you want to get out at, he's just, he's, he's a guy I want on a lot of my teams this year, especially if his ADP doesn't start to rise significantly. Yep. Uh, and I think you can get fifth or sixth round probably on Terry McLaurin uh, right now. All right. Last one we're going to talk about. And, and I, I wanted to mention this because I wanted to kind of talk about the article that I wrote about best ball fragility, but uh, Evan uh, in FFPC, Miles Sanders is the RB eight. Evan also has, uh, Miles Sanders as the RB8, uh, Evan as 12th overall, FFPC, I believe is 10th overall. I just wanted to talk about this, not because Evan is higher or lower than market on it, but I'm curious your take on best ball fragility. In other words, as we draft right now, we won't have any chance to make moves. I think that Miles Sanders is one of the poster boys for this is really fragile because if they sign Carlos Hyde or Devontae Freeman or Lamar Miller, you're going to have to move Miles Sanders down in the top 150. And I think that the Eagles are like reasonably likely to add someone like that. Like they liked what they got out of Jordan Howard. They were the team that signed JJ a few years ago. Like this is kind of what they do. I'm not sure they really do want to saddle up Miles Sanders. Obviously, I don't think Carlos Hyde or Devontae Freeman or Lamar Miller is like a serious threat to Miles Sanders, but I'd be pretty sick to my stomach if I used a first round pick on Miles Sanders and then they go and sign Carlos Hyde. So I think it's kind of fragile right now. And again, I have an article in the draft kit with about 10 guys who I think uh, whose fragility is not priced into their best ball ADP. Uh, but yeah, I, do you factor that in when you do the top 150? I guess is what people want to know, Evan. Are you factoring in that they might sign someone like Carlos Hyde or Devontae Freeman? A little bit, a little bit. Although I wouldn't change Miles Sanders uh, a ton. If there was no threat of that, I would change Boston Scott a lot. Um, who, you know, right now is contingent upon – his value is so contingent upon the Eagles really not signing one of these, you know, Carlos Hyde, who they've been rumored to have interest in. But yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that for me, the fragility and the high volatility kind of nature of best ball leagues and best ball drafts is that is, is to bump up running backs. Like when you're, when you're on the board and when you are, um, you know, in a position where you're deciding between, let's say, you know, a wide receiver one and a running back one who has job security and bell cow running back security, because there, there are just very, are very few of those guys, then I think in almost every instance, you need to lean toward the bell cow running back due to the position scarcity. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier on the show, the, pos- the positions of wide receiver and even tight end, I think, are extremely deep. Quarterback has been deep for, you know, over a decade. Mm-hmm. So um, securing those, those, uh, those bell cow running backs, and those guys are fragile because running backs get injured. But I think that the position scarcity is really uh, what is most important to me. I mean, even if the Eagles sign Carlos Hyde, Miles Sanders is still going to give you, I think, you know, a good level of production. It's just going to cap his ceiling a little bit. And, um, but he, he's still going to end up being a, a good pick for you. But I think that focusing on that position scarcity and you know, when you're on the board between Derrick Henry and Julio Jones, like it's hard to pass on Derrick Henry because you know, he's one of these guys that has monster week to week ceiling and he has, you know, almost the fullest job security. And, um, you know, you can get good receivers throughout the middle and, and even in the late rounds. Yeah. So it's obviously going to be super contrarian to go like wide receiver, wide receiver starts and stuff like that, because you can get Adam Thielen and Tyler Lockett and Terry McLaurin exactly. and Calvin Ridley in the fifth round. If you look at the fifth round running backs, I mean, you're talking about Keyshawn Vaughn, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, right. it's freaking ugly. So, so and, yeah, and, that's going to be a theme. You, And if you do get into a situation where you end up drafting too many receivers early, you have to like, you have to stop. You, know, yeah. you have to like, you know, tell yourself, I'm not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to start hitting some running backs that have a chance to hit um, because, you know, you can fill out, like, let's say you, you start with, like, three or four big-time receivers up top just because that's the way that the draft goes. You have to stop yourself, start taking running backs, and then you can come back and fill out, you know, wide receivers five through seven uh, in the late rounds. 
Yeah, I have an article up about uh, optimal position allocation in best ball, which you guys can check out. But yeah, you don't want to end up, let's just put it this way, you don't want to end up with more than a certain number of wide receivers or a certain number of running backs. And, and there's floor floors also, and I talk about all that in the article. All right, we've said a lot here. Head to establishrun.com. You can read Evan's full top 150, all the articles we talked about in here. Tons of other stuff will be coming down the line. Again, it's $30, but you do get a $25 off coupon to use on any league in FFPC. After you sign up, we will email you instructions for how to redeem that $25. So it's good to be back talking fantasy football draft for Evan, for producer Luke. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.